Hello everyone, my name is Powder and I'm one of the owners of the Asphodel SMP. This video is going to cover all the lore that has previously happened in the world of Asphodel before the main storyline started. Now there will of course be spoilers for all the stuff that happened before and there will be some minor spoilers for future things. Now this video will also have some pretty dark topics in it such as death and sickness, so if that's not your cup of tea I recommend you click off. Now without further ado, let's get started. Before the ancient cities were overrun with Skulk and taken over by Wardens, they were home to the most advanced civilization known to man. These cities were full of scientists, engineers, and the smartest people around. There was one group of scientists who sought immortality, so they began a project to achieve it. In 9795, the Immortality Project was started. This project would soon come to be known as Project Beta. Project Beta sought to create a god, an entity that could grant these greedy scientists immortality. For Project Beta to succeed, it needed life forms to absorb the energy to create its own life. Several people were massacred during the creation of Beta. Several of these people were the scientists themselves, while others were innocent civilians. It took seven months for Beta to begin to show signs of autonomous life. At most, it would wriggle around a bit or move back and forth in its container. While this didn't seem like much, the process of creating life is a very difficult and delicate process, so for these scientists, this was a great achievement. As the year began to come to a close, Beta came to life. The scientists were overjoyed. They had created a god that could grant them immortality. So, the first question they asked it, will you make us immortal? Having been conscious for far longer than it actually was alive, Beta had seen these scientists working countless hours to bring it to life. It had seen their goals and deemed them unworthy. Not only unworthy of immortality, but unworthy of life as a whole. The glass of Beta's container broke. A poisonous liquid and gas spilling out, killing every scientist in the room instantaneously. This gas began to travel throughout the city killing any who inhaled it. A few did not instantly get killed. Their bodies began to morph and mutate into that of a monster, something that is now referred to as a warden. These wardens were infected with Beta's mentality. Beta wished for no humans to live, so these wardens wished for the exact same fate. No matter what it was, human, animal, they killed it. The massacre lasted for days. Blood drenched the streets. Anyone who was still alive would die within a few hours. Soon, from the pools of blood, a darkness began to form. It began to envelop the city, crumbling anything in its path. It feasted on the remains of the citizens, getting deadlier and spreading faster with each corpse it consumed. At this point in time, Beta was still a lump of flesh with a consciousness. But it knew it had to go into hiding. Its form wouldn't last much longer outside of the protection of its cage. Beta transferred itself into an object, becoming lost in the ruins of the city for years to come. The lucky few who survived the horrible massacre had to deal with a new problem. The darkness that had arose from their dead comrades was now beginning to spread quicker and quicker. They gave this darkness a name. They called it Skulk. Skulk was often used as a term for a person whose illness had gotten far out of hand. Since it seemed to infect people, they referred to it as the Skulk Sickness when a person got taken over by it. Effects of the Skulk Sickness, or the Sick, were Skulk-like veins appearing on a person's body, their eyes turning black while their pupils shone a bright teal, and these flowers growing around them whenever they had the opportunity to sprout. These flowers were named Asphodel Flowers. Asphodel flowers commonly grew in a place called the Asphodel Fields, a common legend that said to be an endless field of flowers where souls who were in between life and death went to wander. Mild cases of the sickness only showed a veins appearing on the person's body before they quickly passed away. If someone was lucky enough to survive for a long time while having the sick, they would change in more ways than one. Their hair became a darker color, and their body began to change in more physical ways other than the veins. 
Warden-like horns were often a common symptom of a sickness progressing to a critical stage. Oftentimes, a person's body would change as well, some getting taller, some getting shorter, limbs growing longer or shorter. The longer a person survived with the sickness, the more warden-like they became, giving the sickness the nickname, the Warden Sickness. There were a few rare cases of someone surviving all the way through the sickness and fully becoming a warden. These wardens became just like the ones Beta had infected. Most people only reached a half-warden-like state. In this state, they had great fatigue and weakness, but during combat, their fighting skills were greatly enhanced for the price of their sickness spreading faster while they were in combat. It was unadvisable to fight someone with the sick, simply because just being around them could also infect you, but also because they had such a great fighting ability, it was easy for them to knock you out with one blow. News of the sickness began to spread quickly. Many people wondered how it could be stopped or how it could be cured. No one came up with an exact idea, so several teams of scientists were put together to go down into the infected ancient cities, investigate, and see if they could find a solution. Among all these scientists, two names stood out, Dodie and Powder. Both came from backgrounds with no living family to speak of, thus they had nothing to lose when taking on such a dangerous endeavor. Dodie and Powder quickly became close. They spent a lot of time on expeditions together and in each other's company, so they became friends very quickly. They saw each other as adopted family and would do anything to protect the other. In 9815, an expedition to the original infected city was launched. Powder and Doty were among two of the scientists who traveled down to the city. The research organization Powder and Doty belonged to made a type of filtration mask to filter out the skulk particles, making it safer to go down into the city. During the expedition, Powder went off to look at something by himself. Not looking where he was going, he ended up tripping and cutting his leg open. Without any medical supplies and without an ability to walk, he was stranded where he was, far away from his group. He felt like he was laying there for hours, covered in his own blood and with no way of getting up. Eventually, he heard footsteps coming towards him. Thinking it may be one of his friends coming to look for him, he began yelling for help, quickly realizing that he shouldn't have done that. Looking up, he saw a warden towering above him. He was frozen in fear, unsure of what to do. The warden obviously now knew he was there, not just because of his shouting, but because there was so much blood around, he was sure the warden would be able to smell it. The warden came closer, and Powder closed his eyes, fearing the worst. Before he knew it, the warden had picked him up, holding him like a baby. He wasn't exactly sure why this warden was protecting him, but he didn't want to oppose due to the fact that this creature was still much larger than him and could crush him at any moment. The warden brought him deeper into the city, eventually setting him down on the ground and walking away. Powder thought the warden had just brought him deeper into the city so that he could be killed by something else, but the warden soon returned with what appeared to be a bandage. The warden gently wrapped Powder's leg in said bandage, once again picking him up once it had finished his work. Powder was taken aback that this warden didn't immediately kill him, but instead helped him to get better. The warden put Powder up on its shoulder as it began to wander around the city. Powder got to see the city from a whole new angle he couldn't have while he was just on the ground. He even began to admire the beauty of the skulk a little bit. Many hours passed of Powder and the warden wandering around the city. Eventually, they came to an area where the camp of the scientists was. Powder assumed that the warden would just put him down and be equally as friendly to his teammates as he was to him. But the second Powder tried to leave, he felt the warden forcefully grab him and pull him closer. Now, Powder's teammates hadn't seen the adventure they'd just gone on together. They had only seen a warden force Powder not to leave, so immediately they drew what weapons they had and approached it. Knowing the danger, Powder and Doty both encouraged them to stand back from the warden, but all the warden saw was people trying to take away its new friend. It vigorously attacked any scientist that came close to it killing them with one blow. Knowing there was no way out of this, Powder told the surviving scientists to run and forget about him, much to Doty's protest. Powder knew he could keep the warden occupied long enough for them to get out of the city and to a safe distance. Powder watched as all of his friends he had known for most of his life retreated, knowing he was now trapped in the grasps of this warden and in the depths of the city.
Now, the sickness hadn't just stayed inside the cities. It had escaped to the outside world and quickly traveled through towns and villages. When it first happened, no one was prepared for it, so several people would instantly get infected and turn almost completely into wardens, killing whatever people the sickness didn't. One of these villages was Powder's hometown, a place where several of his childhood friends still lived. One of these friends was named Six. At the time Six's village was infected, he was out in the forest. When Six returned home, he found his village engulfed in flames. Everyone he had ever cared about or held dear was dead at his feet. As shock began to wear off, Six ran over to the body of one of his closest friends. His friend's body was covered in skull stains and his hair had darkened. Six held him closely, trying to hear a heartbeat. But there was none. His friend was dead and there was nothing he could do about it. Everything he cared for had been destroyed. Knowing it was a bit gross but not caring, he brought the lifeless body up to his face, placing a gentle kiss upon his friend's lips, unknowingly infecting himself. Placing the corpse back on the ground, he stood up, staring at the destroyed village. Anger began to flood his body. He blamed himself, he blamed the scientists, but most of all he blamed the people who left the city with the infection and transmitted it to people on the outside. He knew the sickness had to be stopped. He rationalized that just by killing everyone who had the sickness and anyone who ever got infected, it would stop the spread by stopping it from the source. His brain couldn't rationalize that it was the Skulk's fault, not the people who got infected. He knew that they had to be killed and that's all that mattered to him. Six left his village and wandered for days. Eventually he came across a destroyed lab which had several of the filtration masks in it. Finding one that was mostly intact, he put it on himself. During his travels, he had noticed a bit of skulk peeking out from the corner of one of his lips. He knew this was the result of kissing his friend, but at this point he didn't care. He was ready to go to extreme measures to help people who were in need. He formed a group called the Extremists, a group of people who were ready to eradicate any person with a sickness while a cure was being worked on, although Six personally didn't believe a cure would ever be found. He set out on a path of murder and darkness knowing that eventually he would have to take his own life at the end of the road. Back in the ancient city, Powder had began living with the warden who had taken care of him. When Powder's leg had healed and he had removed the bandage, he saw a patch of skulk growing where the wound once was. He knew this would happen. He had an open wound that was bandaged by a warden. He was bound to get infected, especially since he was down here and his filtration mask had broken. Powder decided to make light of the situation and began to live with the warden. This warden seemed to care for him like he was his son, so Powder didn't really mind. He had never really had a parental figure before, so this was pretty nice. Over the course of two years, Powder's sickness progressed at a very slow rate. He thought it might be something to do with the warden taking care of him, or the fact that maybe he was just more resistant to it. Over the course of the two years, Powder began to notice the warden get weaker and weaker. He thought the warden was just tired from taking care of him, but he soon realized it was because this warden, while still fully infected, was dying. The warden and Powder had never spoken to each other. Well, Powder had talked to it, but of course the warden couldn't understand nor respond. But Powder felt some sort of grief inside of him upon learning that his only friend was dying. Powder thought back to his roots. He once was a scientist who sought the cure of sickness, and now he is a really good motivation. He wants to cure himself and cure one of his best friends. He and the warden left the ancient city together. They found the spot above the ancient city where Powder still had easy access to the city but could build a more secure lab for the warden to live in so he could attempt to experiment on it and try and find a cure. All his experimenting and testing seemed to draw the eye of an old friend of his. Using a more secure mask, Doty had gone to visit Powder several times and eventually they rekindled their bond they once had. Doty suggested that since the warden was such a severe case of the sickness, they should try and find a way to cure powder and then amplify that cure on the warden to see if it would work. Doty began running the same tests powder had used on the warden. Not only did having a more human-like subject who still had a consciousness make these tests a lot easier, it made Doty feel a little bit more like a doctor than a scientist. Doty's first observation that she made was powder's blood was now a bright teal instead of the normal dark red that humans had. But the warden had black blood, so this was some sort of in-between stage in between human and warden that Powder was in, which made Doty very intrigued on how the sickness was going to progress. Now, Powder, on the other hand, had the mentality of a child who doesn't want to go to the doctor's office. Powder hated all the tests Doty ran on him. He didn't like being the experiment. 
several blood draws vaccines, and random tests later, they had come to some kind of solution. They had found a way to somewhat minimize Powder's spreading of the sickness. While him touching anything with one of his infected body parts would still transmit the sickness, he could now be in an enclosed space without any worry of infecting the other person when not wearing a filtration mask. On the note of filtration masks, Dodie had been using her newfound information to improve the filtration masks. She had several different variations and quite a lot in storage that all worked just fine. She just made extras because frankly she found it entertaining. This is when the two stories come to a meeting point. One day when Powder wasn't visiting Dodie, Six ended up finding Dodie's house and stopping by. Now Powder had mentioned Six to Dodie in the past, but both of them were under the impression that Six had been dead for a long time, so Dodie didn't have any idea that this was Powder's childhood friend she was staring at. Dodie pointed out the mask Six was wearing was damaged and was an older model. She offered him one of the newer ones that she had made since she had no use for them. Six took note of this and asked Dodie if she was interested in joining the extremist as lead scientist. He would be able to make and give out the best protection gear to his people when they were dealing with infected people. Dodie almost took him up on his offer before finding out that this would involve killing the infected people. Without letting Six know about Powder, Dodie knew she couldn't turn her back on her friend like that. Dodie told Six to leave and to never come back. She would never support someone who chose such violent actions against people who did nothing wrong. But Six wouldn't give up that easily. Over the course of the next few months, Six would stop by quite often trying to make small talk with Dodie and become friends. While Dodie didn't outright dislike Six, she disagreed with his methods, thus didn't want to become too cozy with him. But he was there so often, she had to at least tolerate him. There were some very close calls, though, where Six had almost caught Dodie yanking up asphodel flowers from her yard after Powder had left, or Dodie having to hide Powder in the back room when Six came over unexpectedly. Six didn't know about Powder, and Dodie didn't know that Six and Powder had been friends in the past. Six thought Powder was dead, and Powder thought the same of him. Neither had any reason to believe that the other one was alive. Six had a suspicion that Dodie was hiding something, but he had no concrete evidence, so he didn't say anything. Over the past few years after the establishment of the extremists, Six had recruited quite a large following. While he saw most of them as disposable pawns and lackeys that he could do what he wished with, there was one person that stood out especially to him. This person's name was Natty. Natty was a young girl who came from a village who was also destroyed. Her and her younger brother were the only two survivors. Her younger brother had gotten infected, but it was at a very small stage, so it wasn't a danger to her or anyone else at the moment. While Six and Dodie weren't necessarily friends, Dodie had given Six some of her technology to help slow infections and keep them at a safe stage. Seeing Natty as a valuable asset to him, Six offered to provide some medical treatment to her younger brother in exchange for Natty joining the extremists. Natty agreed, giving her little brother over to Six and his friends to take care of. But Six was not a man of his word. A few days after Natty had been sent out on her first mission, Six killed her brother in cold blood, knowing there was nothing he could do for him and frankly not really caring. It was a few months until Natty returned, and when she did, Six told her that her brother had passed away from the sickness. Not knowing any better, she believed him. Natty was struck with grief. Her only living family was now dead. Her father had died a long time ago, and her mother went missing when the village was destroyed. Natty began to pace and wander, trying to find a way to console herself. One day, she came across Dodie's house. Thinking it to be abandoned, she went inside and quickly found the storage of all the masks Dodie had made. She began taking them, finding a note that was marked with Dodie's initials and names, telling anyone to please not take them since they were valuable to her. Natty disregarded the note and brought all the masks back to the extremist headquarters. Natty had recently moved into a small civilization that was starting to set things back up after the sickness. It seemed most of the people who lived there were completely unaware of the sickness. Natty was aware that these people were in danger, but frankly she could care less about them and honestly found it kind of funny that these people were all going to die eventually. A festival was fast approaching, so while everyone was away at the festival grounds having fun, Natty left a mask at all the people's houses with a note that they should be careful in the future. Towards the end of the festival, Natty and the others went down into a cave to do some exploring. When they went deeper into the cave, they found a patch of skulk and they found Six investigating it. Natty took this opportunity to tell her new friends about everything that had been happening. She also took this time to inform them that she had left masks to protect them at each one of their houses. Everyone felt terror run through their body as they ran out of the cave as fast as they could. 
Natty put on her mask, very happy with what she had done. It seemed like things were starting to look up for Natty. Or not. I mean, hey, she gets to see her brother again. Well, we did it! A huge thank you to my lovely partner, Lycos, who did all the art that's in this video. You can see all the art credits on screen right now. And a huge other thank you to the other owner of the server, Sixbo, who was an amazing help for all of this, and Arthur, who just did a lot of story building. A huge thank you to all the Asphodel members for being so supportive during this project. I mean, we started this whole video, I'm pretty sure, of like, at the at like the beginning of November. So like this has been a long time coming and I'm very happy we finally have done it. A huge thank you to everyone for watching. Please go show some support to all of my lovely people and please show this video some love since it took so long to do. Thank you all so much for watching.